All right, what I like about that video is that it helps us frame these issues in a better way. Um, oftentimes, I know that when, uh, when I do something that I know God would not approve of, um, I view myself as an enemy to God. What Scripture describes, though, instead um, is that sin is the enemy and that, that God's desire is to redeem us and to save us from sin. Does this make sense? So what that video is describing is this, this epic story um, that sin and rebellion exist in the world and in the human heart, but that God has sent a Savior, Jesus, um, to save us from sin and to rescue us from those effects of sin. And the result of sin is separation from God, right? So it, it frames it in a little bit different light. And we, we may say it this way, uh, that God uh, loves the sinner but hates the sin, right? That might be a better way to describe it. So I want us to keep that in mind today um, as we look at this passage. So in your Bibles, John chapter 2 is a really, really interesting snapshot um, into the life of Jesus. It's one of those things that if it were not in the Bible, you may not, uh, you may not believe it, all right? This is a situation in which Jesus finds himself at kind of a worship gathering. They're at the temple in Jerusalem, and Jesus, while this is all going on, while people are there worshiping God, he takes the time to fashion a whip out of leather. And uh, today is the day of props, okay? So don't ask me why I have a whip. Uh, I, I may have borrowed this from uh, one of the other pastors on staff at our church. Uh, we won't mention names, just letters. Pastor GJ, okay? So, um, and uh, this was his Indiana Jones costume, right? Is that right? Okay. All right. So, uh, so imagine the scene, right? Imagine we're here on a Sunday morning uh, for church, and uh, instead of engaging in worship, I'm sitting over here in the corner uh, braiding some leather together, and then I get up and stand up to preach, and I'm just like cracking this whip, like driving you guys from the church, right? That'd be amazing, and it'd be, you guys would never come back, all right? Uh, but that's a little bit what's going on in this, this scene. Jesus is fired up. He's angry over what is taking place in the temple. And let me describe what that is real quick. Uh, and this for Jesus, just so you guys know, there's uh, anger itself isn't a sin. Uh, it's what we do with that anger. Uh, there's bad anger and there's good anger. Uh, this is what would be what we call good anger, that Jesus is angry over the right things, right? This would be called righteous anger. So Jesus is angry because there's money changing going on at the temple. He's, he's angry because people are taking advantage of other people. So if you were a Jew in this, this time, the first century, uh, once a year you'd come to Jerusalem for what's called Passover, and you'd bring an animal sacrifice as your way of closing the distance between you and God, that that animal would symbolically take the place of your punishment for your sins. So people would travel to Jerusalem from all over the place, and they would uh, either bring a sacrifice with them, or if they couldn't bring it with them, they would exchange money, the Roman coin for the Jewish coin, and they would purchase uh, a an animal there at the temple for worship. Make sense? All right. Um, so that's what they would do. But over time, what maybe started out as a good thing uh, began to be abused. And those who were there changing money and selling animals for sacrifice began to take advantage of the situation. So maybe in the exchange of money, they would charge a surcharge and they would make profit off of that. Or maybe in the purchase of an animal, uh, they would upcharge. The, the best example I can think of is when you go to a Tigers game and you go to buy a $5 Little Caesars pizza, how much is that pizza? $100. Yeah, $500, yes, <laughs> yes. That's, that's the only thing that I can think of that would basically help us understand what's going on in the context. Make sense? They know that they have a captive audience. You're there to make a sacrifice at the temple. So they begin taking advantage of this and they begin making a profit off the people who are coming to worship God. Jesus is so furious about this. He's furious about this because they're coming there to worship God, and there's people who are putting obstacles in their way of their relationship and their worship of God. Make sense? I, it makes me think about what would Jesus be fired up about today, right? What are the things that go on today that keep people from worshiping God? And uh, I don't have that list, but I think it's an interesting question to think about. So how I want to frame the message today is with three different uh, object lessons. The first object lesson is the whip, all right? Uh, the Pastor GJ, uh, Indiana slash Michigan Jones uh, whip. 
what I want you to remember um, is this. The whip represents the fact that we should get angry over sin. That we should be angry about the things that keep us from God. That, w- that our a relationship with God is the best place to be. And that we should be angry over the things that keep us from God. Make sense? Make sense? So uh, the way that the Bible describes us as human beings is that we were all created with this propensity to worship. I don't just mean singing songs, but we all, we all will worship something. We'll either worship ourselves, we'll worship other people, uh, or we'll worship God, right? So the challenge isn't uh, that we need to stop worshiping things. The challenge is what is our focus of our worship, right? So we're going to talk about sin, and definition of sin is anything that is against God's will. Just get that out of the gate. Um, but oftentimes when we worship other things, that is, that is sin right there. When we're worshiping something other than God. Um, author John Mark Comer said, we can't just stop worshiping any more than we can stop breathing. So we will all worship something, either ourselves, our feelings, our own pleasures, or we will worship God. Um, David Foster Wallace said, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. When he says there's no such thing as atheism, what he means is uh, that atheism is simply we're choosing to put ourselves in that place of God. So the goal isn't to stop worshiping. The goal is to ask ourselves, what is the object of our worship? Or what are we placing as God? Um, Tim, author Tim Keller said, if anything becomes more fundamental than God to your happiness, meaning life and, and identity, then that is what we'd call an idol or something that you're worshiping. The human heart is indeed a factory that mass produces idols. Um, so let me give you an example of seeing that at work in my own life. Uh, my wife and I, we've been involved in a home renovation project the last couple months, like everybody else on the planet, apparently. Uh, but we've been working on our basement, and part of that has been uh, doing a lot of painting. And so one day I was pouring some paint from the paint bucket into a paint tray, and you know you have that moment when you finish pouring the paint and then you set the paint bucket down. You got to get the paintbrush real quick to wipe off the edge so it doesn't drip on the floor. So that was going on and uh, Raylin saw that I needed some help. So I was going to set the paint bucket down and she was uh, going, going to hand me the paintbrush, but I wasn't quite ready for it. And so in the midst of that, she's handing at me trying to help out. I set the paint bucket down on the paint tray and it just like launched paint everywhere, all right? Now, she was just trying to help me, but my first instinct was to blame her for what had just happened. So I could use some marriage and parenting, or not, mar- not parenting, some marriage advice, some relationship advice when we're done. But my first instinct, and, and, and uh, my pride w- would not let me change my approach. <laughs> you guys know what I'm saying? Like, I dug in. Like, I was not going to acknowledge that this was my fault, uh, only until later, all right? <laughs> But it revealed to me that in that moment, I'm still struggling with the things of like, idolizing myself, that I'm not going to admit my own fault. Does this make sense? I'm going to blame somebody else because I'm obviously not in the wrong. It just revealed to me again the struggle in my own heart that apart from the work of God, um, there's no hope for that to change. But thanks be to God that he can change that in our lives. Amen? So we should be angry about the things that exist in our lives like that that war against us and our relationship with God. So then the second imagery is the imagery of the whiteboard. And that stands for, represents that sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. Let me uh, impress you with some art stuff. Not really. Um, So what I'm going to draw is going to represent um, how sin separates us from God. Why is there laughter going on right now? <laughs> I'm so, thank you, yes. <laughs> I, we will sell this afterwards for anybody <laughs> who wants it. Um, how we understand um, is that sin separates us from God, right? It's basically heading in the opposite direction of God. We're doing our own thing. And a person who's living there and who has never put their faith in Jesus Christ does not have a relationship with God. 
Right? Makes sense? The Bible is clear that sin separates us from God. Doing our own thing separates us from God. Uh, but uh, through Jesus, we can be forgiven of our sin, and we can be in a relationship with God, right? That God says, you and I now, there's nothing that separates us because Jesus had paid for that. And now we can be in a relationship with each other. So some of you are separated from God, and you've never been in a relationship with him. You've never been forgiven of your sins. Your sin separates you from him. And that's, that's the whole problem that the Bible describes, that sin separates us from God. But even as a follower of Jesus, sin doesn't separate us in the same way. But if there's ongoing sin in our lives, we have to understand that can affect the relationship that we have with him. Does that make sense? So it's possible to be in a relationship but still not be close. Anybody understand what I'm saying? You could be sitting next to the person, be in a relationship, but there can be miles of distance relationally. And so even as a follower of Jesus, although I, my sins are forgiven because of what Jesus has done, right, it doesn't change that. There can still be separation. There can still be distance if I am going to continue to do things that are heading in the opposite direction of God. Make sense? I came across this quote a few months ago. This was super challenging um, by a, a Roman Catholic a cardinal. He said that don't deceive people with the word mercy, God forgives sins only if we repent of them. And that's a really, for me, that gets me thinking, right? It gets me, it's challenging. We oftentimes think, okay, God's gracious, God's merciful, that way everyone, it's like a magic wand, but there's still something that has to take place in our hearts where we say, God, please forgive me of my sin. Uh, this is my random, I'm sorry for this, I apologize ahead of time. This is what pops into my head as I think about that quote from from the Roman uh, Catholic Cardinal. This quote from uh, Michael Scott from The Office, uh, Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Is that, no, nobody? All right, all right, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, won't, I won't use that one in the third service. We don't have the third service this week anyway. But, um, but the idea is that there could be something in your life that is separating you from God and that until you repent of that, until you turn from that, it will continue to keep you distant from God, whether separated with no relationship or whether in a relationship with God, but still distant. Um, Cardinal Sarah went on to say, there is no forgiveness if there is no repentance. The word repentance is actually a beautiful word. I think it's unfortunate that we think of the guy standing on the street corner saying, turn or burn, right? Repent. But that word repentance is a beautiful word. It means a change of mind. It means to turn around, right? So it's the idea that, okay, God's over here, for example, if we could use this uh, phys physically, and we're walking away from God. But repentance is saying, God, I'm sorry, and we turn back to God. It, repentance closes the distance. If I'm in relational conflict with my wife, how do I close the distance? If we're separate relations, how do I close it? I go back to her and say, the paint was not your fault. <laughs> I am so sorry. Would you please forgive me? And that closes the distance relationally. With I acknowledge what I did, and I ask for forgiveness. So 1 John, same word, 1 John, the Bible, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, says, if we claim to be without sin, what does it say? We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If you're like, I've not done anything wrong, then you're deceiving yourself, right? But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that awesome? If we claim that we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Bottom line is we should be angry about sin because sin separates us from God. Okay, so the whip, what does the whip stand for? It stands for Pastor <laughs> GJ. <laughs> and by the way, it's everything within me not to try to crack this in here. I know that we'd have a lawsuit on our hands if that were to happen. But uh, maybe after service, you guys can go try it out. No, no never mind, it's, it's GJ's. Yeah, you have to sign a liability waiver. Wow. So this, the whip represents that we should be angry over sin. The whiteboard represents what? That sin separates us from God. And then the last and the third image is the image of the waste barrel. 
the waste barrel. They all had to start with W, so it couldn't just be the barrel. It had to be the waste barrel. All right. So the waste barrel represents and stands for the fact that it is time to get rid of whatever keeps you from God. Trust me, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Whatever you're holding on to that might be keeping you from closeness with God is not worth it. I'm so thankful that Jesus wasn't passive in this story. Jesus could have seen what was going on and just said, oh well, right? Boys will be boys. They will do what they will do. I'm glad that he wasn't passive, but he was active and he rooted out that sin. Um, Here's a question for us. I think this is a powerful, challenging question. But if Jesus were to pick up a whip and bring it into your life, what would he drive out? If Jesus were to come into your life and drive out some things that shouldn't be there, what would he drive out? What would he do? So here's what I want to challenge us to do with three different things, kind of some practical stuff right now. I want to challenge you to accurately define sin. Accurately define sin. We're very good at rationalizing. I'm sure the people in John chapter 2 were making rationalizations saying, hey, we're helping people, right? They're coming to worship God. We're just trying to help them but they had begun to worship possessions and money instead of God. So how do we define sin? In 2021, the most popular question to ask and we're trying, when we're trying to evaluate moral right and wrong is, number one, how do I feel? How does it make me feel? And the second question we try to ask is, is it hurting anybody? Let me ask you a question. Is that the right way to define right and wrong? What, we're missing a question, aren't we? The question is, what does God say? Right? That's the question. When we're asking the question, is it hurting anybody, we're putting ourselves in the place of God and assuming that we know all the different ways that something's going to help or hurt somebody. We don't know that. We're assuming that we are the the center and the focal point, but God is the center and the focal point. The definition of sin is not how we define it, but it's how God defines it. We're asking the wrong question. We ask, is it hurting anyone? The question should be, what does God say? So accurately define sin. Number two, I want to challenge you to acknowledge the enemy or acknowledge the conflict that you're in. As Cam talked about with this idea of battling, if you don't know what you're fighting, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to win the battle. Uh, for, For months at the home we lived in in Indiana, we had um, what I thought was a mole problem you guys know there's actually something else called a vole? Did you guys know that? I didn't know that either. <laughs> but unless you know what you're battling, what you're fighting against, you're not going to be very successful in, in defeating that. So what is there specifically in your life that is holding you back, that is keeping you from a close relationship with God? Um, in, uh, in this devotional by author Levi Lusco, it's called Take Back Your Life. This was super helpful to me um, in 2020. Um, as a way to say focus on God, but in here he describes that uh, this character in his life, he, the things that he doesn't want to do, he describes it as as uh, evil Levi. Um, instead of just Levi, he did, that's that's evil Levi, and he doesn't want anything to do with evil life. Evil Levi, that's a tongue twister. Um, but what is it for you? What is it? What are you battling in your life? For some of you, you may be battling um, to stay sexually pure. For some of you, you battle worry and anxiety and fear. For others, you battle the struggle for money and possessions or jealousy or comparison or fun or pleasure. Maybe it's substances. Maybe your battle is against substances of some kind. Maybe you're just entertaining yourself. We're we're entertaining ourselves to death. What is it that's consuming you? And like I said, if Jesus were to pick up a whip and come into your life, what would he drive out? So then the third uh, thing I want to encourage you to do is to identify that thing and then act like you're in a war. Act like you're in a battle against that. Jesus gets a, gives some pretty drastic uh, information in Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6. He said, it's better for a person to lose their eye than to lose their entire body Uh, to hell. He basically says, if your right eye causes you to sin, what does he say? You guys know the line. Gouge it out. That, that, um, I was gonna say that'll preach, but how how does that land with an audience? (laughs) 
Can you imagine the original audience hearing that? We're used to that phrase, right? But can you imagine the original audience going, uh, this guy's a little bit extreme. <laughs> but what's Jesus' point? His point is that don't let anything keep you from God. And if you have to get drastic, get drastic because it's worth it. Nothing is worth keeping you distant from God. Nothing is. No other people, right? No, no situation, no substance, no issue is worth keeping you separated from God. So what is it that might be keeping you from God? And the cool thing is about this, like we said at the beginning, is that we are not alone in this battle. It's not us against God. It's God with us against sin. Amen? It's the fact that Jesus came and stared sin and death in the face and conquered those things. He became victorious for us, and our victory is in him and through him. That we are forgiven of all of our sin, past, present, and future, because of what Jesus has done for us. Amen? So we fight in the power that he gives us and the victory that he gives us because of what he's done on the cross. First John uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate the Father, uh, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice, what does it say, for our sins. So uh, growing up, um, I grew up in the church. Um, my dad was a pastor. And so uh, I did all the church um, growing up things. And uh, if you were in the church in the 80s and 90s, um, church bonfires and like youth group uh, campfires were a thing. So you'd go to these like uh, gatherings and there'd be a speaker, there'd be a worship service, and they would challenge you, hey, if you have anything in your life uh, that is keeping you from God, uh, we're, after the service, we're going to have a bonfire. We want you to bring that with you. And what? What would you do with it? You burn it. Yeah, you guys know. You guys know. Um, you burn it, right? So it's that moment when... Uh, you know, you're wrestling with, okay, God, I know that there's some stuff, and God, God highlights some things. He points some things out, and what's powerful about those moments is you feel the Holy Spirit uh, pushing you and challenging you. You feel nervous inside, and you're, like, fighting against it. Like, I don't want to give that up. I don't want to surrender that, whatever it is. Then finally, um, you say yes to God and say, God, I, I want to give this up, and you take that thing, and you put it in the fire. You guys don't have, know how, how badly I want to have real open fire uh, in this today. <laughs> But it wouldn't be worth it. Service would be over, like, right away. Uh, so, um, but you take that thing, and you burn it. And it's, it's getting rid of the, the physical thing, but it's also that connection or that, that heart string that you had that was holding on to whatever that was that was keeping you from God. And so for me, when I was younger, uh, it would be things like, like music, right? I maybe had some music that was in my life that uh, was altering my state of mind, and not in a way that was drawing me closer to God, but in a way that was taking me further away from God. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? It was basically, Josh, you do your own thing, right? Don't worry about God. You got this. And uh, that was not helpful. So moments of surrender, uh, taking th that CD. You guys remember CDs? And, uh, and, and throwing that uh, in the fire. Other people would bring magazines or they would bring uh, items of clothing. Maybe it represented a relationship that they had that was keeping them from God. Uh, or maybe they would bring, you know, something that was a hope or dream that they had that maybe wasn't God's hope or God's dream, and they would surrender that to God. Um, what I want you guys to do is, um, on your seat when you came in, or as you were walking in, somebody may have handed you a little card, and I'm going to give you a chance to write down what it is for you to respond in your own way. What is it that is keeping you from God? And if, yes, front row, if they might need some help with pens. If a uh, second row behind them can hand them some pens at home, you guys can do this as well. But I want you to think about that. And I'm going to share with you um, a couple things for me. I don't want to ever ask you guys to do something that I'm not willing to do. So as I thought about this, as I was preparing for this message, um, I thought of three different things that I think at times get in the way of my relationship with God. Uh, the first one is the fact that uh, oftentimes I am way too worried about what other people think of me. And I'm more worried about what other people think of me than what God thinks of me. And that's a problem, right? That gets in the way of my relationship with God. 
because I will do things for how other people will view me rather than for what God wants me to do. And so I thought of the best way to represent that is with a selfie. <laughs> I'm focused on myself. Focus on myself. And uh, God wants me to say, um, I'm done with that. I declare war against being worried about what other people think of me. I want to be more concerned about what God thinks of me. Right? So this one goes bye-bye. I wish I could set it on fire right there, right now. Poof. The other thing that I think holds me back from a vibrant relationship with God um, is I get too busy. I allow myself to take on too many tasks, do too many things, and I don't have time for God because he gets pushed out. I'm sure I'm the only one that ever does that. Um, So I want to acknowledge today uh, with my to-do list, right, my to-do list, endless to-dos, I want to acknowledge that um, God needs to come first in my life before anything else. God, I want to put you first, and I want to declare war against being busy um, so I can have time with God. Then the third one for me um, was an unusual one, but there are times in my life, and I, I feel, um, I'm trying to think how to say this, I feel like it shouldn't be this way as a pastor, but uh, pastors are people too, right? <laughs> and so, uh, man, I get so frustrated. There are times in my life when it comes to my relationship with God, sometimes um, I'm very apathetic in my relationship with God. Does that make sense? Where it's just like, I know that I should be spending time with God, reading my Bible, but eh, you guys know what emoji goes along with that? <laughs> Not the poop emoji. Somebody first service said poop emoji, although that works well for lots of things, all right? But it's the, it's the meh, meh. I think a lot of people struggle with, with apathy, right? We just, I just don't care. And I want us to confess that and say, God, I am sorry for my apathy, that, that my relationship with you should be the most important thing and that, that's, that's worth pursuing. So the way that I represent that is with my pillow. <laughs> that's, you know, not that I'm lazy. I do lots of things, but here's the thing. Am I, am I passionately pursuing the things of God? That's the question. With my one life to live, am I giving it all for the things of God? Or am I using it for other things? So my apathy in my relationship with God, I want to declare war against that. So on this day, I'm writing down what I'm declaring war against. I'm asking you to evaluate and ask God to search you as well. Um, What do you want him to do in your life? What is keeping you from him? What is keeping you from him? So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that you're bringing to mind things right now, that you're convicting us of things right now, and that we would not fight you, God, but that we would willingly give these things up you are helping us. God, help us to be in a close relationship with you. We don't want anything to keep us from you. God, thank you for helping us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can keep writing on that. When you're ready, you can stand and we'll sing together.